friendos, this is Jeremy uh, coming to you live from my living room. Uh, that's probably incorrect because I, you guys are not watching me live, but I like saying it, so I'm going to say it anyway. So today we're going to talk about chemistry, um, but why not have a little bit of fun with it? So we're not just going to talk about uh, chemical reactions, but we're actually going to talk about it through tie-dye, um, which we'll uh, talk to you more as the video goes on. Yeah, as Jeremy said, we're going to be talking about uh, different chemical reactions and the processes of solubility and absorption within the context of tie-dyeing clothing. So what is tie-dye? Well, some might say that it's this beautiful form of art and expressing yourself. Um, you guys are going to really like the uh, outcome, the products of what this process uh, gives to us. Um, but at the same time, it's also a very uh, chemistry-based process. And so it's a perfect way to learn about chemistry. Um, so during this lecture, uh, we're gonna um, we're gonna find some way to uh, make some art and make something fun, make something cool to wear, but also learn about some chemistry along the way. Hey, so here is some useful terminology that will be useful for the rest of the presentation. So absorption is a process by which matter takes in another substance. Um, so the absorbed substance is evenly um, spread throughout the absorbing matter. So example would be like a sponge to a uh, sponge and water, the sponge being the absorbing matter. And um, yeah, solution is a mixture in which one or more substances are dissolved into another substance, um, the dissolved substance being the solvent and the other substance being the solute. Um, solutions are made up of elements or compounds and mixed together at a molecular level. Um, a mixture is a um, combination of two or more substances that are combined physically, so they're not um, chemically mixed. So there's no chemical reaction that happens when the two are combined. And insolubility is a physical property that describes the ability of one chemical substance, um, how one chemical substance dissolves into another to create like a uniform solution. Um, so yeah. All right, some other terminology to go over. Uh, the first is polar substances. So this is um, any compound that's made up of particles that have an uneven distribution of electrons. Um, this creates a negative and a positive side. So it's an um, unequal uh, distribution of charges. Um, these compounds could be anything um, such as H2O, HCl, which is hydrochloric acid, or NH3 which is ammonia. Um, we have nonpolar substances, uh, which is kind of the opposite, which is um, compounds that are made of particles that have an equal distribution of charges. Um, so these, the, this includes compounds like carbon dioxide or methane. Uh, diffusion is the movement of particles from high concentrations to low concentrations. So anytime you uh, mix two substances together, um, they will equally diffuse through the container um, to uh, space themselves out. Uh, chromatography is um, a group of separation processes used to analyze compounds, uh, isolated compounds. Um, this is used uh, in a variety of different ways, but it involves a stationary phase and a mobile phase. Um, each phase has um, will make the substances either um, go forward through the process or keep them um, from from separating. So, in terms of the experimental procedure, uh, something to keep in mind uh, with any experiment that you engage in. Uh, you'll always have a structure that you will use to guide you from beginning to end. Um, in the earlier stages of an experiment, you have uh, a section that is um, focused on compiling information 
um, information that you'll use to sort of contextualize your results later on in future in, in future uh, stages. So in this section, uh, things to keep in mind, um, what are some materials that you observe? Um, predict how these materials are being used and uh, refer back to previous slides to label each of the stages. Uh, moving forward, you'll perform your experiment. This is when you'll uh, engage with the experiment and uh, start, uh, I guess, collecting data. Um, from there on, you will move on to the last uh, stage of an experiment. And here you'll start to uh, make conclusions and start analyzing what exactly happened uh, in the experiment based on the information that you've compiled. So, so I'm just going to go over the reaction that happens when you bleach your shirt. Um, the video kind of goes, shows you everything you need to do from the process, but I'm just going to go over the actual chemistry behind it. So bleach contains um, a compound called sodium hypochlorite. And sodium hypochlorite is what we know, is what is known as a strong oxidizer. And what these things, what oxidizers do is that if there's anything that's a weaker oxidizer than them, they will steal their electrons. So all our clothes and everything that has color has like these molecule compounds called chromophores. And they're the things that reflect light and cause you to see certain colors. And these happen to be weaker oxidizers than bleaches. So what bleach does is it takes the electrons from these chrom chromophores and then causes the chromophores to change shape so that you see a different, a different color of light after the bleaching happens. Um, so basically what happens is you're stealing electrons from the shirt and then changing the color that you see because the, um, because the um, configuration of the, elect the compound changes based on the electrons around it. Um, now we're going to go over safety with bleach. So safety with bleach. So while you're doing the experiment, just like if you have gloves, just uh, make sure like you're wearing them so that none of the bleach touches your skin or whatnot. Um, don't wear any valuables while doing this in case, because you don't want to damage them or whatnot. Uh, white clothing if you can, so that if you do get bleach on any of your clothing, that you don't you know, bleach them or make them change color. Um, doing a controlled environment where you won't really ruin any, any of the surroundings or like a well-ventilated area as well. And if you do get it on your hands, don't touch your eyes, face, or mouth during the experiment and make sure you wash your hands afterwards. And after experiment, dispose of everything appropriately and safely. So next, I'm gonna be talking about a second experiment that we conducted, but instead of bleach, we use some fabric dye. So just some essential materials that you guys are gonna use is the fabric that you're gonna be dyeing. An important one is the fabric dye and some safety and precaution supplies that you guys need is a um, pair of gloves because the fabric dye can dye your hands. And also if you have some sort of plastic bin or plastic to protect the countertop or your floors, just to make sure you don't dye any of that. And another thing that I wanted to mention is that, well, it depends on the fabric dye that you use. So always follow the instructions. In this case, it, we just needed some warm water and then our powder was the fabric. So here we relate it back to what Chibusa was talking about, a homogeneous mixture. Here, our water is acting as our solvent. So it's gonna be doing the dissolving and then our powder dye is acting as our solute. So essentially what a solute is, is that it's the thing that's gonna be dissolved. And if you guys see, once we shake it, the solution's all even. It's just a purple solution creating a homogeneous mixture. And then after that, you guys can pour it into a plastic bag and then fill it up with um, your fabric dye. And now Donnie will talk a little bit more about some key findings on the chemistry that's taking place of when the dye is ap applied to the fabric. All right, because um, you are using uh, two reagents, the, the fabric and the dye, it is better to use cotton or natural materials. Um, this will help soak up and absorb um, the mixture. Um, anything synthetic will not bond the molecules properly. Um, and then 
because it, when you use natural materials such as cotton, this allows the bond to become permanent. Um, the the dye and the 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 fabric dye and the cotton will form um, covalent links that will help the um, solution di uh, diffuse through the cotton fibers. Um, this bond, the bond that the dye creates with the fiber materials allows the dye to wash, to stay permanent even after washes. Another thing that I wanted to add is important to wait 24 hours, especially when dealing with fabric dye, because the longer um, it has to wait, the more the dye is going to be absorbed by the fabric. So you want to make sure as much dye is um, absorbed by the fabric so you get the results that you need. So that was experiment two. So here's just the additional video for you guys. If you guys happen to try tie dye at home, it gives you more of a detailed um, video of two different techniques that you can try. If you have different colors or if you want to um, experience a different technique, this is just an additional video for you guys. So we hope you enjoyed our tie dye lecture. And we also hope that you'll take this opportunity to try it out yourselves and um, you know, make, make some awesome fancy shirts during this quarantine. And when you come back to school, just everybody would be so impressed by the, your colorful new wardrobe. So, um, but at the same time, uh, while it, this is a really fun thing to do and you get something awesome out of it, let's also take the opportunity to put our scientist hats, uh, hats on and um, really look at the uh, makeup of this experiment because this is what this is. It's a chemistry science experiment, right? So. Um, I'll, let's walk through uh, the different facets, different components of this experiment. So um, as in every scientific experiment, there's an independent variable, right? Which you guys are most likely familiar with. And the way I remember this is like, you know, Miss Independent don't need no man. She does what she wants. And so um, in when you're looking at an independent variable, um, if this is the one that does what it wants, meaning like you do what you want with it, meaning... Uh, this is the one that you change. So in this in this uh, experiment, um, it would most likely be, which if you haven't thought it out already, it, this would be the uh, makeup of your dye. This would be um, the different just components of the dye that uh, you uh, use to bleach to uh, to dye your shirt. And of course, like you know, that's the main thing that you have control over, and you want to see the effect that that independent variable has on the outcome. And that leads us to the dependent variable. So the way that I think about dependent is um, <clears throat> like, uh, this might be a little bit a little more complicated way to remember it, but uh, a dependent on like a uh, um, income tax, um, an income tax uh, kind of uh, income tax return. I don't know, I'm kind of blanking on that. But um, see, a dependent depends on something else. So like a, a kid depends on his parents to, you know, feed him. And, and stuff, um, but so the dependent variable reacts to the independent variable, meaning um, it changes depending on what you do to the independent variable, right? So in this case, what would it be? Of course, it'd be your, um, your the final product. You know, when, when you're finally done with all the dyeing and you, know, you uh, unfold your shirt to see if this, how it turned out, that's your dependent variable right there. That's what happened as a result of you changing your independent variable. And of course, like as you uh, use different dyes, different chemicals, um, different uh, dye makeups, that dependent variable will change. Meaning, so the shirt would come out different based on like what you used. So um, moving on, um, these are, these are the, the, the easy parts I like to think. So the controlled variables, controlled meaning like you control them as in they don't change at all. So those are um, static, they don't change and um, as you do the experiment over and over and over and over, you would be changing the independent variable, but you want to uh, keep the control variables constant so that um, you know that it's the independent variable causing the change in the dependent variable um, and <clears throat> not anything else. So if you were to uh, think about a control variable in this experiment, it'd probably be um, the shirt that you make, I mean, the shirt that you use. So 
it, your diet would turn out different if you use like a white shirt and then you use like, you know, an orange shirt the next time. And then after that, it was a purple shirt. It, it, it would look different. Your dependent variable would be, uh, um, it, it, it would come out different, but not as a result of the independent variable, right? So control variables are just the things that you keep constant just to make sure that the experiment is, um, the integrity of it um, stays and that um, any change that happens is a result of what you do with the independent variable. So <clears throat> um, I like to think that um, if you list your control variables down, you should be able to write it down on a sheet of paper and send it to somewhere else, like send it to some guy and some, some, you know, someone in Alaska or something. And then they, they would be able to read off your independent variables, your control variables, your dependent variables, and they'd be able to do the exact same experiment. Um, <clears throat> so, and lastly, uh, whether there is a control setup for this. Um, so the control setup is basically like um, the procedure of the whole experiment. So it lays out, um, okay, these are the independent variables, these are dependent variables, and these are the control variables. And um, this, is, this is for the sake of consistency in, in this experiment. And uh, there you have it. So um, actually, if you think about it, even though we're making like fun shirts and everything, these things aren't all that different from uh, like medical experiments or, you know, like uh, um, physics experiments and, you know, what they do in NASA and stuff. Like all those experiments have an independent variable, a dependent variable control variable and every and you know all these things we just talked about so if you can understand it in this fun little thing then you'd be able to pick out the independent variables the different variables um in an experiment like that nasa runs or what we do at uic so yeah um if you can identify those and are comfortable with those concepts uh, you're doing awesome um and if not reach out and uh we'd be happy to um just explain it more if we if you uh if we need to so yeah all right well thank you all so much for watching make sure to keep up with your emails and everything we send out also don't forget to complete your surveys as jeremy said if you'd like to reach out to us shoot us an email and we'll gladly help